Hello everybody and welcome to the CIM Marketing Podcast. I hope you had a good Christmas and a good winter, if it is possible to have a good winter. Spring is now sprung, as evidenced by the torrential rain outside our window, and we are back. And we are back with one of the greats of the CIM Marketing Podcast, Miss Gemma Butler. Gemma, how are you? I'm good, thank you, from a flooded Moore Hall. Yeah, we're back at Moore Hall. It's fantastic to be here. And Gemma, as you'll know, if you are a seasoned uh, listener to this show, was former director of marketing here at Moore Hall for CIM and is now working again with CIM as an educator in the area of sustainable marketing. So what better way to start our spring season? And I've already been in touch with you all indirectly by reading your article in the latest Catalyst about green hushing and it struck me as quite ironic that we're here to talk about sustainable marketing we want people to talk more about sustainable marketing we want people to do more about sustainable marketing and lots of companies you're telling me in your recent article have stopped talking about sustainable marketing why well, green hushing is uh, is a choice organisations are making not to make green claims or talk about what they're doing in relation to their sustainable agendas for fear of being called out for greenwashing. We have seen a rise over the last two years of green claims, uh, an explosion in fact of green claims, and whilst the majority of greenwashing is generally unintentional, Greenwashing is now subject to stricter regulations, tightening of guidelines around certain terms you can use, and that has pushed organisations back to essentially not want to talk about it. But greenwashing is as damaging as greenwashing in some ways because it, um, it slows down progress and education and awareness. Could you even argue it's more damaging because greenwashing, although it's, uh, it's empty promises, at least it's raising the agenda of... The, of sustainable marketing and it's, it's a negative it's a bad way of doing it but at least it's putting on the agenda and what seems to be happening from what you're telling me is in boardrooms people are saying if we make this claim and we can't properly stand it up we can't properly substanti substantiate it we're going to be in a lot of trouble ergo the easiest thing to do is just not make the claim not do anything and not say anything I think it's it's more complex than that in terms of the breadth and complexity of the subject of sustainability. I think what organisations doing, if you start with the evidence and then work back and what claims you can make from that, you should be completely sound in terms of you know the green claims you make. I think what organisations are doing is thinking that they have to fix everything now, and that's impossible. You know, if there's so much decarbonisation, biodiversity. You know, all of these different elements, packaging, waste that they need to deal with. And I think what they're saying is we won't talk about any of it because if we come out and talk about our decarbonisation targets, we'll get called out for other things. And I think mm. there's this balance, you know, there is no 100% way to be sustainable. It's impossible. And well, that's quite interesting, though, isn't it? So what you're saying is that there are areas in which companies are doing good and doing well. And there are some areas, and this applies probably to every company in the world, where they're not doing as good and they're not doing as well. And there's this phenomenon where if they say, start shouting about the things they're doing well, which actually you want to hear about, because it's best practice and other companies can follow it, the blogosphere, the internet, etc., etc., social media, will then say the things that they're not doing well. So if they put their heads above the parapet and they get shut down. In fact, in many cases, they are doing some good things, but because they're not got a universal good behaviour, very easy to shoot them down. And that's the world we live in, sadly, today, isn't it? So how do we combat that as marketers? I think this is where we need to uh, go back to looking at why we exist as organisations and our purpose. I think it's really important when you are... There's sustainable marketing and there's marketing sustainability, and I think it's really, really important that... We broaden out the narrative and as marketers we go beyond our products and services and we look at how we can have a conversation about this, an ongoing conversation. You know, marketing sustainability is not a campaign and it should never be approached as a campaign. We have to have this consistent conversation and only through having that dialogue and that shared value and that two-way conversation can we talk about things and talk about our progress and be transparent. I think transparency is probably the number one thing that organisations need to be around their sustainable agenda. Um, you know, Lego tried something and it didn't work and they came out and said it wasn't going to work and it didn't work and 
there was a whole, you know, load of people that jumped on that. But they were brave enough to say it didn't work. I think the next step is to come out with what they plan to do next around it. So that's quite that's quite interesting, though, isn't it? So as long as you, if you start by establishing an ongoing dialogue with your customer, you can be pretty honest about what you're doing well, and you can be honest about what you're doing less well, and you can actually have a conversation with the consumer about how you can improve those areas, what would work for them as customers. Um, and you're less then you're less prone then to just being shot down as if you struck me about what you were saying was that it should never be a campaign so if we do we're going to do a campaign to show how green we are then you are putting it ahead of the parapet and to be shot down because it's a sort of, sort of one hit you're trying to do it in one hit but if you're having an ongoing consistent dialogue with your customer around these areas you're much less at risk to um, those sorts of attacks absolutely if you i mean as i said it, it it can't be approached as a campaign because you will essentially lose the essence. The, the focus has to be on sustainability if you're talking about sustainability, not that you can make a claim about sustainability. Therefore, by understanding your own impacts within your organisation, having a sound, sustainable development plan, and they can change and they do change and targets move in and out and things don't work and things do work. But unless we have these open and honest conversations. I mean, look how, if sustainability was easy to solve, we would have solved it by now. But it's one of the biggest conversations happening in the world today. It's one of the biggest challenges we face as humanity. And we have to start talking about it. Do you think there are any or many companies that get it, that get the, the difference between treating it as a campaign and treating it as a conversation? I think there's many companies out there that do understand it, absolutely, and they are pulling together sound and strong sustainable agendas. I think there is just this barrier when it comes to talking about it within society, which is where marketing comes in, you know, raising that S in ESG, um, that we, we seem to be hitting a bit of a wall. Mm. So what would be your measures then to overcome that, do you think? I know you've spoken in the past about changing narratives, talking more to the consumer understanding a little bit more about how commu how consumer behaviour can be tweaked and changed. So what measures would you employ to get from, to move from the campaign model to the conversation model, to make the conversation model the default rather than the campaign model, which we know is very flawed? I think from the start point, marketers need to educate themselves on what's happening, you know, in the broader operating environment because there is so much changing you know consumer behaviors are shifting what they want we're seeing that people want to live with purpose we're seeing that people want to shop with purpose and we need to look at that action intention intention action gap and how we close that so I think marketers need to get educated and understand the wants of the markets which is their role and they need to bring those insights back in as the connective tissue between the organizations and society and then I think within the organizations they need to understand what's happening on their sustainable agendas you know, and work with the sustainability teams or whoever is, is, you know, responsible for that and then sit down and think about the ways that they can have that dialogue, how they can, as we say, share, more sharing, less broadcasting. And I'm not saying that you can't do a campaign on sustainability, but where I would come in with that is you look at things like social marketing where you have that ongoing campaign that runs consistently at certain periods but then look at what you do on your social channels. How do you talk about things? You know, social impact companies do this brilliantly. They talk about everything from their products, how they're made, through to how you get people to engage on more sustainable behaviours like, you know, refill and recycling and all of those, you know, models around circularity. You know, you're not going to change the narrative overnight, but I think you've got to plan ahead and think about how you keep this conversation going. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you spoke in the past about the things I've read from you and heard from you. There's, there's this tension at the yes. moment in the market between awareness and understanding. Yes. So awareness is increasing amongst the consumer and also amongst the marketing industry. But understanding is not necessarily increasing, or certainly not increasing at a quick enough rate. And what I mean by that is... People are aware of the problem, they're very, very cognizant of the problem, but they're not always clear, as marketers or as consumers, what they need to do to solve the problem. Yeah, and it's really interesting because that trend, so Deloitte, Cantar, Porta Novelli, an agency called Savanta, have all come out with the same, 
the same trend, which is awareness and concern around climate change is growing and growing at quite a rapid rate. And rightly so. I mean, you only have to look out of your window Um, and it's affecting everybody across the world. But a lot of the research that's coming out around terms associated with sustainability and sustainability terms is still incredibly low. And if you think about the terms net zero, circularity, carbon neutral, carbon offsetting, they're quite technical terms. And was having a conversation just yesterday around the fact that do consumers actually have to understand what these technical terms mean? And I would say no, because as marketers, we should be the ones to almost explain and interpret those terms in a way and translate them into a way that, that consumers can understand. So instead of talking about circularity, we talk about reuse, refill, repair, all of those things. And the, we, we focus on the behavioural side. So they don't necessarily need to know what the circular economy is. It'd be great if they did. But it's, you know, you have to meet people where they're at. You have to meet people with something that's relatable to them to get them to engage. Yeah, there's a lot of professional scientific jargon around this stuff, isn't there? So the patois has developed that, that, that sustainability experts use. And that doesn't always resonate with the consumer and that's a problem because you're hitting a brick wall if they don't understand these terms like circularity and what it means to them in terms of changing their behavior we've got a real problem how good do you think marketers are so far at making those translations i think some organizations some marketers are doing it very well and it's a bit of a woolly answer but others are not thinking about it like that and i think that's because there's this focus on other things. You know, AI is also a massive conversation. There's a lot of distractions out there. But I think those that are doing it well are effectively, you know, using the right words and language. And again, I go back to the social impact companies. If you look at the likes of Who Gives a Crap, Tony's Chocoloni, Too Good to Go, Olio, just the words and language they use in relation to sustainability. They don't use the S word. They don't talk about sustainability. They literally talk about behaviors you know too good to go talk about rescuing food it's a really i think it's a really lovely way of talking about something you know they're saving 300 odd million meals as opposed to we're tackling food waste you know so what do they do too good to too good to go so too good to go take food that is about to go off its sell by date or they work with with you know the likes of the coffee chains and independent and independent retailers and independent cafes and, and things like that and they work with them in a partnership whereby food that is going to go off, they bag that up in not too good to go themselves, but the organ, you know, the, the independent coffee houses and, and such. They bag that up and then they sell that off through the app and people go along and collect those bags of food. They're almost like blind bags. You don't know what you're going to get. So similar to what you get if you if you sort of like me go to the supermarket at nine o'clock at night, which I do because it's the quietest, you yes. often get these sort of bins where exactly that. there's a whole bunch of you know bread and so on and so forth that you can get for tuppence yeah Uh, and if you don't buy that evening it gets destroyed yes but they're actually automating that process and appifying that process so they can get that stuff out yeah presumably not working with the big multiples the big supermarkets as yet well they i mean they they when we interviewed jamie crummy the founder of too good to go you know he talked about the fact that they've removed the stigma from the yellow labels in supermarkets people are now proud to go and rescue food when i go into the supermarket my daughter i say should we go and rescue some fruit and vegetables you know and it's a really great way to engage with but they are they have appified it but they've also just started or not just recently they announced their um their partnership with Unilever. Right. So and they work, you know, across Europe with massive, massive um, retailers. So, you know, they are they are growing and they are doing things in, in different ways, but they ultimately are tackling food waste. It's interesting, isn't it? The, the, the language that you use there makes a huge difference. Huge. You know, rescuing food rather than, you know, collecting waste food or creating a, a reducing waste it's, it just sounds it just sounds more visceral it sounds like a positive step it sounds like something that's fun to do that you're going to benefit from it's a great example of how marketers can introduce better language to change behaviors but we're still a long way are we not from getting making that the norm yes we absolutely are it's about and i get this the wrong way around all the time so you might need to cut this bit out but john john grant said to us we need to stop trying to make normal things seem green and make green things seem normal yeah yeah so 
If we're going to do that, as marketers, we need, first of all, to make people aware of what is green and what is not. And when we were talking pre-pod, you said something to me which absolutely resonated because I think it's one of those things where people do not realise they're having an impact. You know, I think people know that if they're chucking food away at home, that's not green. They know if they're buying stuff that is, that is more packaging than food, that's not green. Um, they know if they're uh, buying stuff that you know, contains lots and lots of chemicals, that's not green. But what, there are a whole bunch of activities that happen day to day which people aren't even aware of have a big environmental impact, aren't they? And give, us some one that you, give us some of those that perhaps might surprise our audience. I think you're talking about marketing's carbon footprint, aren't you? Well, and I didn't want to put too fine a point on it. And that's so there's marketing sustainability, which is how you talk about your products and services and what your organisation does and the purpose, and you go beyond those product services. Then there's sustainable marketing. And that's aligning your marketing to the organisation's sustainable agenda and supporting it. But that's also making sure that your marketing activities are sustainable. And for example, when we interviewed the Environment Agency, every department in the Environment Agency has a carbon budget, Mm. exactly the same as a finance budget. You get X amount of carbon, and if you go over that, you can't do any more activity or you have to borrow it from another department can right? you buy it from another company no nope. nope. so so you've got your carbon budgets and you've got your finance budgets so when we talk about carbon budgets and the, all organizations will need to have decarbonization targets in place at some point moving forward and you know well 2030 2050 they're around the corner aren't they so when we talk about marketing's carbon footprint digital now has if you look at the numbers and believe the numbers, and they do, they do very slightly, but ultimately digital, not just digital marketing, digital as a whole, so all the streaming and the videos and the servers and everything has a bigger carbon footprint than the aviation industry. Goodness me. But when you take marketing... So, so let's, just, let's just put that one down and make sure that everyone who's listening to this pod has heard that, that digital marketing... No, digital. Digital, not just marketing, digital has a bigger carbon footprint than the aviation industry. The latest figures I saw was around 2.5% for the aviation industry, about 3.2, 35 for digital. You see, I, I'd think that if you took 100 people off the street and asked them that question, you would probably get something close to zero people thought that that would be the case, that it was outstripping aviation. I mean, think about the power that AI requires, and it's only going to get more power-hungry or intense, should we say. But if we think about it from a marketing carbon footprint perspective, the majority of what we do in marketing is digital. Why? Because of the reach, because of the eyes, and because the fact that, you know, in many cases, stuff like email marketing doesn't cost an awful lot of money. You can reach a lot of people in one go. And every email has a tie. Everything in the world has a carbon footprint, okay? And emails have a tiny carbon footprint, but we send... Last year, we sent 322 billion emails a day. How many of those were read? I think the latest... Or acted upon? I think something like the latest click-through figures is is down under double digits. And the bounce rate's over 10%. And if you imagine your own email habits, how many people have email boxes that are just dedicated to spam? How many people sign up to stuff that they never ever read? The waste is catastrophic, okay? If you add all of that up, and there's loads of debate over whether email is damaging or isn't damaging, you know, but ultimately, if you were to put a cost against every email you sent, you would have a very different behavior. So Mm. why do we not associate the same thing with carbon? Websites are the same, so I I looked at figures where it's estimated 576,000 websites a year are a day are created, only 15% of websites actively in the world are, are active, um, only 15% of websites are active across the world, and then we've got to think about things such as, you know, our advertising, um, all of this comes with a carbon footprint associated with it. So, you know, we do a lot of work with marketers around greening your channels do you even consider the impact your marketing's having and actually as marketers we should be looking at the impact of what we're doing is having naturally to see if it's having any cut through but I think the world of digital has opened up 
this spray and pray approach, hasn't it? You know, you throw enough spaghetti at the wall and hope that some of it sticks. It certainly has opened up a spray and pray approach. Um, we don't necessarily think that's a good thing in terms of marketing outcomes, nevertheless, never, never mind sustainability outcomes. But it does strike me that if you are trying to make those changes, you are looking at a huge culture shift in the sector that you've got to affect. Where do you start? I think we go back to the basics, don't we, of right message, right audience, right time, and, and apply those. And I think we just need to be much more mindful of our activities, you know. And this is where we also have to marry up, you know, out of home versus there's, there's an interesting organisation called Unifida who do a carbon calculator. And they have looked at the cost of, of traditional channels is higher in terms of monetary cost, but the cost of carbon when it comes to digital is, is, you know, it completely flips that on its head. So I just think as marketers, we, it's something to consider. We absolutely not need to be thinking about how we green our channels. We need to be thinking about the activity and also reducing that noise as well, which we've been talking about for years. You know, there is we so have. much noise. We are served ridiculous numbers of ads every day. The numbers vary, you know, depending on which, which report you read. But ultimately, when there's a, something like a 0.2% click through on ads, that's a lot of waste. And I think, mm. you know, like the demand side emissions that marketing is is responsible for with you know people purchasing products and the waste of that those products generate i think we have to look at our digital waste because it's it's off the charts it's interesting isn't it because we've moved from a sort of uh, an attack on merch waste that people can see and that's in many ways easy for people to understand that yeah. you know you go to a conference to get a bag of plastic goods those plastic goods sooner sooner or later end up in landfill um, people can see that that's wasteful and to some degree we've, as an industry reduced that this is harder to uh, envisage in yeah, your mind you can't see it. because you can't see it I mean does it actually is it ultimately going to come down to the heavy hand of regulation that you know governments are going to have to say to companies as you say you've got a certain um, uh, carbon budget You've got so many employees, you've got this is your turnover, ergo this is your budget, and you've got to stick to it. And once you've run out of that budget, you can't continue any activities unless you can find budget from somewhere else. I'm not sure that government would be able to do that. I think organisations need to um, take responsibility for that. I think there's a, there's a lot of organisations out there who, because of scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, and those organisations that have decarbonisation targets, there's very much, you know, when they go out to tender for business, unless the organisations that come in to, to, you know, want to bid for that business don't have decarbonisation targets, they are being, you know, they're not getting past the first gate. Aha. So I think this is where, within the business world, pressure between organisations is going to hopefully come into play because your scope three emissions are basically out of your... They're, they're your supply chain. They're all of the things that sit outside of your control. Yep. Therefore, you can work with somebody if they are not looking at their emissions that could blow your scope three emissions. Mm. Likewise, marketing, if they're not aware of their own carbon footprint, can blow the organisation's scope one emissions because... Yep it is essentially you know, not aware of the emissions that it's putting out there. So we, we talk about the fact that the need for marketing to support its organised sustainable agenda goes beyond just talking about sustainability and, and what the organisation's doing. There is that physical carbon budget there that they also need to be aware of and support. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because the, the, market, the market is starting to work in some regard there with ESG reporting, as you say, and the fact that if you're a supplier... You are contributing to your client's uh, own uh, carbon budget, and if you are the client, you also have your own uh, carbon targets. Your own carbon targets to deal to deal with. So everybody in that supply chain is contributing to each other, and it becomes a commercial imperative. Presumably, that's the great hope: is that that commercial imperative becomes ever stronger as we move forward, and it, the, almost the market drives this, rather than having to rely too much on government regulation. Yeah, and I think there is a place for regulation, but we shouldn't be waiting to be regulated into doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about you. It's fascinating stuff. You're working with CIM Academy. You're working separately, uh, partnering with CIM as an educator. 
in the area of sustainable marketing. If people want to take one of your courses and they're going to need to know this stuff for the reasons we've discussed, what sort of courses are you offering? What are you doing? So I teach uh, for CIM Academy on their sustainable marketing qualification, but with Can Marketing Save the Planet, we are partnering with CIM on a range of online courses, ranging from two-hour bite-sized courses up to eight-hour full uh, courses and you know they're accessible they're scalable and we cover topics such as effective sustainable communication greenwashing 101 and they're just there you know they are there essentially to educate marketers to make them aware and to enable them to do sustainable marketing and market sustainability and presumably it enhances their understanding greatly in a relatively small space of time so it's for a small amount of learning they can enhance their understanding very quickly. Absolutely, and we absolutely, as marketers, need to be place a responsible lens over the work we do, ask a different set of questions, but to do that, we need to be more aware, um, and we need to, you know, as Seth Godin said when he came on our podcast, to, first of all, we need to talk about it, but to talk about it, we need to understand it. You need to understand it, and there's a separate point here, isn't there, that if you... Once you've gained that understanding as marketers, you are able to communicate that understanding better to the rest of the business, which of course is a key role of marketing in so many areas. You've got to manage up. You've got to manage sideways. You've got to be able to know this stuff to communicate it. And sometimes that's a great challenge, isn't it, for marketers? Absolutely. I mean, if you don't understand your organisation's sustainable agenda and it's not being talked about internally and internal comms are just as important, then how can you effectively talk about what you're doing externally? And I think that's a really, really key point you raised there because, you know, marketing should be working with H as well as sustainability departments should be working with the HR departments on how do we, you know, break down that narrative and start that conversation internally because everybody's roles, no matter which department you work in, has sustainability in them. What are the key mechanisms then to, to make the CEO listen, to make the CFO listen, to make the CHRO listen? What are the key tools, what are the tricks to get that communicated across? It goes back to the age old, we have to build the business case for it. You know, whether, you know, it, it's all well and good saying that this is the right thing to do for the planet, this is the right thing to do for society, but that will not ultimately get the buy-in, will it? We, you know, it has to also be a good business case. And I think you can bring in the pressures that are mounting from, mounting from investors, from consumers wanting, you know, to live more sustainably, shop more sustainably. And I think you can bring in the, also employees, you know, employees want to work for organisations that align mm -hmm. to their values. And there is a huge amount of climate quitting happening at the moment. And if you look at the latest report from Deloitte, Gen Z and millennials will walk away from organisations or not accept roles at organisations that are not taking sustainability seriously. So there is, you know, the stakeholder chain, there's pressures at each each stage of that stakeholder chain. I think it's really incumbent on organisations if they want to get the best talent and, and retain that talent, they have to take this seriously and they have to be seen to be doing something about it. So building that business case, you say, for the boardroom, there is plenty that can go into that business case from a regulatory point of view, yep. from a stakeholder pressure point of view, but also good business is good for business. You know, There is so much evidence out there that those organisations who are you know, taking sustainability seriously are making much more profit. But it's not just about making profit. Often we forget that if you are more sustainable, you are also more efficient and there are a lot of cost savings to be made as well. You optimistic for the future? So my business partner is incredibly optimistic. I am incredibly pessimistic by nature, but I am optimistic. And I think that there is no better placed person than an aware and educated marketer to drive a more sustainable future. Well that's a great call to arms. Gemma Butler, thank you very much indeed. What an amazing conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you Ben. <laughs>